everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Scrubbed In Show. I hope you've all been keeping well. This week we have with us Ethan, who is the co-founder and CEO of ProGrad, which is essentially a new platform helping young people understand finance better and helping them make better financial decisions. And the cool thing about them, they showcase a lot of side hustles for people. And as you know, me and Ams are big, big fans of side hustles. Ethan, absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. How are you, buddy? Thank you very much for having me today. It's very nice to, uh, to be here with both of you. And I'm doing very well. What about yourselves? Thank you. We've, you know, good, we've had a day you. of recordings, sharing lots of different stories. So your story is slightly different because, of course, your background is non-medical. However, you are building something that is a very close passion of us, which is finance, young people, side hustles. So you're doing incredible work with ProGrad. You know, you've got a lot of good traction. But before we talk about ProGrad, we want to talk about your journey into the world of finance, into this, you know, startup world. So take us all the way back to the very beginning, you know, a young Ethan who is starting his journey into the world of careers and, and you know, trying to figure out what he wants to do with life. Sure. So the story really begins, um, not begins, but like starts when I was at university, if I can say so. And first day of university, my co-founder Marco and I met each other, lining up for the local pub at university at Queen Mary. He was studying uh, economics and finance, and I was uh, reading law and politics. <laughs> and we basically met, were queuing, and became friends. <laughs> we then uh, shared some passion over time to create something together. He initially was really focused on the financial world, so he uh, did a few internships in finance, uh, in different private equities and investment banks. And I was more focused on law and technology just generally. So really focusing on doing some internships in the legal world, uh, working on uh, technology. So did a coding bootcamp, learned how to code. I joined a Series B startup and in essence, um, had an amazing time with them working there and learning a bit more about technology. And our passion, I would say, uh, started when like my passion was really on the tech side. Mark's passion was more on the financial side. And uh, together we, we really came up with this uh, fintech idea that we had. And that's really the genesis of ProGrad, or like the genesis, I would say, not of ProGrad, but the genesis of how we started, how we shared this passion. ProGrad mm -hmm. really started when uh, Marco and I were both struggling to uh, find ways to fund our postgraduate degrees. And that's really how ProGrad started, when we shared this common problem together by looking at different ways uh, to fund our respective postgraduate degrees. And we then decided to start ProGrad together in order to help future students find better ways to solve their problems. No, definitely. And I think students and money finance is a big thing. And I agree there is a lack of healthy financial education and understanding about it all. Before we kind of talk about ProGrad in the first few days and kind of that journey, tell us a bit more about how it was working for a Series B startup. Because obviously they're a bit further along in that journey. Tell us what you did there. You know, what was the good bits that you found in there and what were the bad bits so we can make sense of it all? So I'd say, um, so to, to be honest, I joined them at seed stage and then I left uh, post Series B. So really got to witness the growth oh, wow. inside, which was uh, fascinating. And so the company is a fintech company as well that sits between London and New York. Really interesting uh, concept. They're doing it uh, quite well. And I really learned a great bunch of both about like just uh, creating a good product, what it means creating a good product, validating it with customers, all the way to creating a strong team, a team that makes you happy to uh, to work with, who you're happy to go to the office on a daily basis and just meet as well. So I really got to witness the growth from inside, all the good things uh, that the company was doing and learn and uh, take some lessons that I then went on to, uh, to use when I co-founded ProGrad. I'd say some of the bad things are not necessarily uh, due to them, but just generally some of the lessons I learned on the more negative side, which are massively positive today, are just the fact of being extremely resilient, understanding that things can go bad, understanding that things will go bad by definition, and just got to take them, understand them, and in essence, keep moving forward. And these are some of the things that I learned there, I learned at uh, the company that I was working for, and helped me massively in my journey and still helping me today. Ethan, just to understand you a little bit closer, right? Tell me why entrepreneurship? Why startup world when you could have gone down, become a, a lawyer, had a nice stable life? Why the stress of entrepreneurship? Tell us a little bit about that. 
So I'd say uh, entrepreneurship to some extent runs in the family. So my dad and uh, and his father and his father as well uh, created their own company or created and worked in the family company and then uh, basically developed the company even further in the, in the business sectors in a very different area than uh, the area that I am in. But I always had this passion on my dad's side. My mom and my uncle also started their own company uh, many years ago. And so this mm. passion really ran in the family of being able to create your own company, starting something from scratch. And to be yeah. honest, I would say just the daily thrill, the daily thrill, <laughs> I'm sure you guys feel as well, rather than going for this uh, most secure job or what's uh, known as the thing to do, in theory, yeah. uh, going for the safer path. I'd say when I tried those different internships, I enjoyed them a lot, but didn't have the thrill of things moving very fast, things uh, being basically under your control, things depending yeah. on your input. And this is what I really enjoy on the entrepreneurial uh, side of things, where I can create certain things, obviously with, a, with an amazing team, but everything mm -hmm. is based on what me and the team want to do together as a team, rather than just listening to what something or someone has to tell us, and this is what you're going to do without really questioning it uh, more. And this is something that I really enjoy on a daily basis and definitely worth it, uh, not going for the safer option in order to have this uh, daily trend. <laughs> no, Absolutely. definitely. You can, we can see the passion, you know, when you talk about why you're building program, the life of a startup, tell us about the first few steps to building this idea. You meet your co-founder, you have different skill sets, you're passionate about this problem. What were the first few steps to get this off the ground? So I'd say the first few steps were first to uh, do some initial market research, understand what the problem is, understand is it a problem that my co-founder and I are facing? Is it a wider problem? How can we try and go about uh, solving this problem? Speaking with a lot of people. I think it's really important to get out of this uh, framework that, pe that people don't want to speak with other people because you're afraid that someone's going to steal your idea. It doesn't really happen. It doesn't happen this frequently. So I think speaking with a lot of people, not just speaking with friends, but like speaking with people that will put you in this uncomfortable position of asking mm. those uncomfortable uh, questions and, uh, and things that you haven't uh, thought about. And so this was really the first step for us. Then going on to speak to some potential clients or people who we thought could become our clients in the future to understand how their problem uh, is or how do they perceive the problem. And then speaking with some people who could help us uh, get it off the ground. So initial advisors that had uh, deep connections uh, or different people with uh, different resources. And then basically creating this initial MVP or this initial, uh, even like deck of this is the problem, this is the slide. Let's go speak with uh, more people, understand are people going to be willing to pay for it? Yes. Let's build something. Let's understand how to build it and basically scale from there. What was the biggest problem you found out in the community by young people, um, especially when it comes to finance? I'd say one of the big problems with young people in, uh, in finance is that there's a massive a lack of awareness of how to use certain financial products, of what the consequences of uh, using certain financial products, how to uh, how to use them, how to understand them, how to uh, understand the consequences of these products, and just a lack of understanding of, to give you a concrete example, uh, people, for example, now with inflation, people understand, oh yeah, okay, interest rates have gone up, but what does it really mean for me on my day-to-day? -day? Yes, things are more expensive if I go to Tesco or Sainsbury's, but further than this, what does it really mean for me as a person? Does it mean that I will have less money to do certain things? Does it mean that if I need a credit card now or increase my limit on a credit card, no one's going to give it to me because interest rates are higher, so less likelihood of me to be able to repay certain things. This means that the lender doesn't want to extend my debt facility. All of these things are really important, and young people just don't have the understanding or enough of an understanding of this or like, you know, what's a credit score, how to build a credit score, and all of mm. these uh, terms that should be part of a young person's uh, language, but are unfortunately not nowadays. And so this is really some of the issues that we see with young people on a day-to-day -day basis. No, definitely. And tell us a bit more about how ProGrad comes into the picture. What is it that you can do on ProGrad? And, you know, why has it taken off so well? What, what's the beauty of it all? So I'd say before explaining why it has taken off so well, uh, let me just take a bit of a step back and understand and sorry, and explain in a quick uh, nutshell what program does. Mm. So in essence, program is a marketplace allowing uh, the Gen Z, we define the Gen Z as 18, 28, 18, 30 year olds, probably an extended uh, version of the Generation Z, to mm. find ways to earn, save, borrow, or invest money through various companies on our marketplace. 
Hmm. And the idea is that we help a young person, a young customer comes to our program, set a specific goal that they're looking to achieve, a financial goal. And we then do the heavy lifting of helping them uh, get to their uh, specific uh, goal. And what I mean by this, a customer will tell us, I'm looking to um, get to this specific point in my life. Could be in a, a month, six months, a year. It could be an immediate goal that you're looking to achieve. And a customer will tell us how much money they're looking to get. A customer will never come to program looking for a specific product like a credit card mm. or loan, but will really come with a specific problem that they have or a specific goal that they're looking to achieve. We will then do the heavy lifting by asking them a bunch of questions. The heavy lifting on our end to then match them with the most relevant way or ways to achieve this specific goal and guide them along the process. So this is one of the things that young people really love about ProGrad. It's the fact that we don't advertise, they don't perceive ProGrad as being a platform where they get advertised left, right, and center. Mm. They really perceive ProGrad as a platform where they can learn, they can find the right solutions to their problem or the right solutions in order to get to their specific goal without feeling advertised to you. So we really mm. build this trust with young customers and give them access to specific side hustles, specific uh, ways that they can borrow money. And mm. we validate and vet all of the companies that we have on site before we give them one of these companies for them to outbound to. And this is really important. And one of the reasons why young customers really like ProGrad because they can come back, find different ways to earn money quickly or over a longer period of time or find ways to uh, save money, etc. And so this is really important that we give them real solutions to current problems that they are facing uh, nowadays. Young people have a lot of time, don't have a lot of money, but as yeah. a student, you usually have a lot of time. Or as a young person, you have a, quite a bit of a spare time, but you usually don't have the amount of money that you'd like to have. And this is why I think progress works well and can work very well. It's the idea that we basically are here to fill this amount, this gap that you have, this time frame that you have by mm. giving you some money to earn on the side. Mm. Um Ethan, so w when you were doing your first sort of market feedback, talking to your first group of users, right? Um, what was their feedback when you told them, okay, did you know about this? Did you know about that? Um, did you find that it was a lack of awareness or a lack of understanding? Or what, what were some of the, the, the problems on the ground that your users were facing? So I think twofold. So on the one hand, uh, the problems that some of the companies are facing, which is being able to uh, be in front of the Gen Z, being able to captivate their attention, being able to mm. be a, a Gen Z cool brand in essence, uh, mm. that Gen Z customers would be even interested in looking at them. So we help them with this. We give them the right audience for them. We also give them the right marketing tools or the right ways to market themselves in front of our audience on our site. Yeah. So this is the first uh, part of the problem that we are, that we're solving. And then the other one to come back to your question is really the idea of speaking to our customers and understanding that they couldn't find a lot of our companies that would really be their friends in essence, and not just companies where they would, they would see a lot of advertisements or a lot of things that they would not even understand, but really find a company where they can learn from understand, find the right mm -hmm. solutions to the problem. And this is something that customers were lacking this lack of having a genuine friend of yours that can mm -hmm. help you guide you towards the specific goal that you're looking to achieve. And this was some of the feedback that we received early on, along with uh, some of the things that we didn't do as well and that we had to improve. But generally, mm -hmm. uh, this feedback was massively helpful for us to uh, learn and improve uh, our product and be in the position that we're yeah. in uh, today. And just to follow on from that now, so you mentioned the marketplace problem and we know how hard that is, the chicken and egg problem, right? You have to tell us, how did you crack the chicken and egg? <laughs> I'd say uh, there's a lot of fake it if you make it uh, to <laughs> some extent, but the idea mm. is you try and bring uh, some of uh, at least one party to the table. Usually I would say it's a bit easier to bring some of the companies to the table because you promise them that you're going to have uh, enough people for them. Some of these companies are not willing to join you until you reach certain levels. Other companies mm. are willing to take a better new, either because you have a good relationship with them or because they really believe in your product. They fill the gap as well. Uh, or they feel the problem that they have of not being able to be in front of the Gen Z. And so you basically give them this promise that you will find a solution for them. So you bring yeah. them to the, uh, to the table, then you start bringing customers and then you really start building from there. Then you don't have enough companies. You go chase <laughs> a bunch of companies. You, know, you don't have enough customers. You go chase a bunch of uh, B2C customers. So it's really this uh, continuous, uh, to this ongoing battle of let me bring more people, let me bring more companies, et cetera, yeah. to the table. No, absolutely amazing. Definitely. And I think um, one of the difficulty things of marketplaces is this chicken egg situation. But then once you get kind of that flywheel going, it kind of looks after itself. The 
something that a lot of our listeners who are builders and founders, entrepreneurs themselves are, will be interested to know about is kind of your journey with Techstars. So Techstars is probably one of the best accelerators in the world alongside Y Combinator and a few other ones. It's super competitive to get into it. What advice would you have people apply for Techstars and what has your experience been off the back of it? <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. So I'd say one of the things uh, or one of the advice for to get into Techstars is before you write your application, try reaching out to a bunch of people who've done Techstars, who are at Techstars at the moment. Some of the MDs are extremely receptive and are willing to speak with you. Try mm. to really understand how to create a good application rather than rushing to an application. Take your time to really understand your problem, really be able to articulate your problem, to really be able to, dem to demonstrate that you've done the legwork of understanding what your problem is, validating that this is a problem, validating that people are willing to pay for it, even if you're not at this point yet. And I'd say this usually goes a long uh, way uh, to get into textiles. And then speaking with some people who are in, who have gone through or are uh, currently doing textiles, they will be able to give you some tips really when you write this application on how to make it even uh, crisper, even more exciting mm -hmm. uh, for textiles or when textiles read it. And at the end of the day, you really got to put yourself in the shoes of uh, the people at Techstars who are reading it. And just think about it in this way. If I were to invest my own money, would I invest it in this company versus like hundreds or like thousands of other companies that are applying to? And the answer in essence should really eventually get to a yes, I would, because this company knows what their problem is. These companies have spoken to not one or two customers, but thousands of customers mm. that are willing to pay for this. This company knows what they're building. They know how to do it. They just need a bit more guidance, a bit more structure. And if I find this company, this is the one that I want to invest my own money in. And if you can genuinely answer a yes about your own company with that, by trying not to be as biased as possible, which is really hard, then I think you have a better chance of getting into mm. textiles. And once you're part of textiles, they really uh, throw you into the mud of things and throw you in front of hundreds of advisors, hundreds of people that will tell you business apart in a healthy way <laughs> for, you, for you to really understand, crap, I got it all wrong. Let me understand it even more. Let me do some more research. Let me scale from there. But then textiles would give you this, uh, this real infrastructure of helping you and also the structure of understanding how to, uh, what are the next steps, how to raise money, who to speak to, how to create this fear of missing out when you are building a product. All of these mm. important uh, lessons that you uh, usually as a new founder, you might not be aware of, of the importance of these uh, lessons. Mm, definitely. Tell us how you deal with rejection, failure to a certain degree when someone's tearing apart your business. And we know when you have your startup, it's like your own baby. How do you deal with that? How do you get into that mindset where you take the feedback on board and you build something bigger and better? <laughs> I think like to give you a concrete example, I got a message uh, today from someone I was reaching out uh, to potentially partner with them. And mm -hmm. they came back telling us, we wish to decline your offer, but wish you well. <laughs> this really resumes uh, the lesson in the sense that you just got to take it uh, under the chin and continuing and understanding that one partnership, even though like at times in your business and we had it very early on as well, we told that if we close this one specific partnership, that's it. Like, you know, we'll become a unicorn in a, in a week. <laughs> or if we close this partnership, that's it. It's the end of Prograd. I think that's an important lesson for us that we've learned that no one single partnership will make or break your products or your company. And if that's the case, then you have a bigger problem that you have this one a single line of dependency or risk of failure. Mm. So you really got to put yourself in this mindset that not one specific partnership will make or break your business. And again, mm. if you're in this position that this partnership will make or break your business, you have a bigger problem that you should fix before thinking about uh, partnering with companies. No. So that's really the lesson that we've taken is that it's fine. Some companies are not going to be willing to partner with us today, might be willing to partner with us tomorrow in a week, in six months. And that's fine. There's so many companies out there, so many amazing other companies. We'll find the right ones to partner with us versus basically uh, feeling sorry for ourselves when <laughs> one company is not willing to work with us. And Ethan, tell, tell us a little bit about the Techstars mentorship now. So as a, as a startup founder, right, um, talk to us a little bit about the value of speaking to advisors, speaking to people who've been there and done it. Um, what have you learned that we can learn from you? So I'd say it's interesting because the way it works at Techstars, or at least used to work, I'm not sure if it still works today in every uh, different Techstars program. But when I was at Techstars, the way it really used to work was that you would, in essence, uh, over the first three weeks, speak to about 100, 120 mentors during a, what they call mental madness. 
and you would speak mm. for 10, 15 minutes uh, to every mentor. You would need to pitch it to the specific mentor. Do you, do you research on the mentor? Pitch it to the mentor, explain your problem, um, and then basically have the mentor help you or tell your business about in a healthy way or really help you make some uh, further introductions afterwards. The idea is that you speak to people that are really knowledgeable in sales, marketing, B2B, B2C, uh, tech, um, every single aspect of fundraising, everything that you can think of, and they can really help you grow your business in essence. You then select a few mentors that you really like, that you want to stay close to. They also select a few companies that they want to stay close to. And then mm. basically you uh, remain uh, in contact with those mentors for the remaining of the remainder of the program. And uh, they help you uh, build your business or help at least help you with some advice uh, when building your business. I'd say some of the things that some of the things that really came out of it was the fact that you shouldn't be afraid to uh, pivot. You shouldn't be afraid to make those changes, especially not early on when you understand that things don't go the way you want to. You should be able to pivot, to be lean enough to really understand. Oh, it's not going how I want to. Let me change it. Let me improve it. Let me uh, fully like change my entire business model and do something a bit different. Do things differently. And you should be uh, you shouldn't be scared of this. And that's, I think, the main, uh, I'd say, line that came across uh, speaking with those mentors. And to be honest, one of those things that we also did, so we had a bit of a pivot or an evolution, I would say, in our product. And this uh, and mental madness and textiles generally really helped us understand uh, the importance of it. I want to talk a little right, bit definitely. about pivoting because we're we're in we're in the process of pivoting as well, right? Um, a little bit about pivoting. Can you tell us a little bit about sort of the challenges and the fears of pivoting? So, for example pivoting a whole business model, how your users, you might, by the time you pivot, right, you might have, say, two, three thousand users, and suddenly you're going to now change the product. Um, how did you go about pivoting? What are some of the things you did to make sure that it was a successful pivot? So I'd say the most important thing uh, when pivoting or just generally even when launching your business is listening to what the customers want. You think you know what the customer wants, but like you speaking to two or three of your friends or like your parents or like your brother or sister and telling them this is what I'm going to build and everyone telling you, oh, this is amazing, is not really giving <laughs> you the right feedback that you, uh, that, that, that you need. In essence, it's really often it's uh, comfortable because like, oh, yeah, like people around me are supporting me or think like, you know, uh, that what I'm building is the right thing. But you really should go um, get the feedback from people that are going to put you in the most uncomfortable and uh, stressful situations. And this is the real feedback that you that you're looking to get. So speak, don't speak to like two, three, four, five customers. Speak to like hundreds or thousands of customers. Obviously through surveys, through uh, bigger groups uh, that that you bring them together, and then some people individually as well. And really create a structure where you get this feedback until you start building your product, until you launch your product, and then even when you launch your product, when you're looking to scale your product and all of these things. So I'd say this is really important uh, to get to that point where you have the right loops of uh, of basically feedback, understanding, evolving, changing your product before you get to uh, to uh, properly launch or pivot your product. I'd say mm-hmm. getting into this position this mindset is really effective when are trying to both launch a business or pivot from where you're currently at and obviously some of the challenges include the fact that you're extremely stressed and worried and you think that crap i have my current business this mm. means if i pivot uh, my revenue might go down initially because by the time that i build a product um some people are gonna ask me questions oh like it's been like x months and you've been working it and we don't see the results and obviously you on a daily basis see so much change but people from the outside will only see the big uh the big uh, changes in essence, mm. or like, you know, when you launch, uh, when someone writes an article about you, all of these things. I just got to understand that this is definitely not the reality of things. And you just got to like, you know, take it and continue to work through your pivot or your challenges until you have a product that you're comfortable with and that your customers feel excited about, excited to pay in essence. Mm. I once like heard this uh, sentence that said something like, you know, you can have like how like your product can be as great as you want to, but if there is no one who's willing to pay for it, you don't have a business. And that's really true. Yeah. Until you don't have the first, second, third, hundred thousands of customers that's really willing to pay for it, another friend that's doing you a favor, you don't have a business. And that's yeah. really the mindset that at the end of the day, you gotta have people that are willing to pay for it. And if you're solving a real problem, people are gonna wanna pay for it. No, definitely. And I agree. I think you're giving like solid advice for anyone starting their own business and some of that shows as to why ProGrad is doing well. I mean when I looked at it, it was like twenty thousand users, now it's like above forty five thousand users. So definitely you're doing something right. The question I wanted to ask is you're the 
co-founder, you're the CEO, you're leading this company, you're responsible for the vision, the strategy. What makes a good leader? How are you looking after your team and making sure you're building this good culture? So first, I'm not sure I'm a good leader to begin with. Uh, I would like <laughs> to ask my team if they think the same. Uh, but in <laughs> essence, I'd say a good leader is not just someone who, um, who basically thinks he or she knows the way, someone who really shows the way and really goes through this way and this direction with your entire team. I'd say one of the things that my co-founder and I really uh, like to do and hope that we're doing in the best possible way is really trying to remove to the extent that it's possible this hierarchical structure in the company by really putting everyone on the same uh, at the same level. And basically my feedback isn't necessarily better than like someone else's feedback just mm -hmm. because I'm the founder of the company. Everyone's feedback's as relevant. You have a different feedback, doesn't matter. You've been with us for a day, a year, 10 years, 100 years. You have your feedback, let's listen to it. I will give my, uh, my opinion, my thoughts, and we can both challenge each other until we find something that the majority believes is the right thing to do. And I had this very recently with one of our employees where I was focusing on one thing, she was focusing on another, she gave me her thoughts, and I in essence thought that she was right, and that was the right thing for the business to do. I think that's really important to understand mm. that at the end of the day, you may have started a company, but if you want to build a successful company, you need to have an amazing team. Like the team is the most important asset that you will have as a, as a founder or as a company generally. No, definitely. And I think that that's very good advice for people that are also building a company, the team, the mindset. You recently did a successful raise, you fundraised over 2 million pounds. Tell us about that process, kind of the, the, the difficulty of it, because we know it's very difficult. And what were some of the things that you think you did well that allowed you kind of close the round? I would say fundraising just generally is not uh, the easiest thing to do just generally, just because at the end of the day, like, you know, you have your business, you're looking for someone to invest in your business. It's, uh, it can be uh, quite daunting at the beginning, quite stressful. But again, putting yourself in the right mindset of having the right advices, the right uh, product that you're building, uh, the mm -hmm. right solution, showing that you have that you can scale, that you have a problem that people uh, are facing or a solution to problems that people are facing really goes a long way uh, to raise money. And I'd say one of the best advice that I received uh, when uh, before we started to fundraise, or two pieces of advice is that the best moment to raise money in essence is when you don't need the money. Because mm. investors are looking to invest money, you don't need money, you're comfortable, you're not rushing through any terms, you're not rushing through uh, finding uh, average investors, but you can really focus on finding the best investors for your business mm. and all of this. And that's really important because you can create this fear of missing out, which is extremely important with investors, create this uh, fear of missing out where investors really want to invest, understand that your business is the right one, and not just because of the fear of missing out, but mm. partially obviously partially because your business is great and you need the right team to uh, build the solution, but also then partially because you uh, managed to create this fear of missing out with investors where they're like, oh, crap, like everyone's investing, I need in, I want in, I want to invest my money in this specific company. You also really got to understand that when you raise money, you're not like an investor is not doing you a favor when uh, he or she takes a call with you. And you got to get out of this mindset where like they're doing you a favor and you're so thankful for their time and you really appreciate this. Of course, you're thankful for their time, but in the same way that they should be thankful for your time. And you really got to spin this narrative of or like change the narrative of like they controlling the meeting versus like I'm controlling, I'm in charge, I'm controlling the meeting, I'm going where I want to because they're not doing me a favor by taking a call. That's their job. That's how they make more money is by investing money. So if I didn't exist or like my business and obviously other businesses like mine didn't exist, they wouldn't have a way mm. to, make, to uh, make more money of the money that they currently have. So you, they're doing you a favor, but you're doing them a favor as well. It's equal in that sense. So you really got to get this narrative. And the last, and I'd say probably the most important thing is at the end of the day, investors are human beings. And what I mean by mm. this is don't look as, a, as an investor, as a bank that you just come to him or to her when you need the money as a dot in essence, that you just tap into this dot when you need it. But look at them as a specific, as a line in essence, that you're trying to cultivate this relationship with an investor over a period of time and really understand what they're looking for, what they want to invest in, etc. And when the time is right and you're looking to raise money, you've already done so much of the legwork because you've done all the research on the investors. You've been speaking with these investors for the last three or four months when you didn't need the money. And then mm. now that you really want to raise the money, the investors know you so well, the investor feels comfortable uh, investing their money in you. And the investor, in essence, will basically have this understanding of like, 
this team of founders really build what I ask them to, or not build what I ask them to, but like it's really going in the direction that f- makes me feel comfortable to invest mm-hmm. my money. So cultivate this relationship and don't look at investors as they've invested money. I don't need them. I don't, I'm not going to speak to them until my next fundraising. No, cultivate this relationship over a period mm-hmm. of time. This is the best thing. Those people, especially if they're the right investors, they can help you. They can make introductions and they can be massively helpful to your business over time. I think um, that was very good advice. And I like the approach of, you know, I think sometimes when you're building a company, you're in awe of investors and all these people that you think are responsible for giving them a capital for you to survive and build a thriving business. When sometimes it's not, like you said, it's an opportunity and you should treat it as such. The question I wanted to ask is in the fintech space, especially in kind of financial literacy education for so many young people, a lot of startups are coming up. It's starting to become an emerging market. What makes ProGrad different to other existing platforms or other uh, startups? I would say one of the things is that we're focusing on a very niche segment of the market, Gen Z, mm. and that we really got to this point where we find the right uh, companies for uh, our customers. <coughs> Sorry, our customers to uh, to uh, find a side hustle way to, to make some money, etc. So you have a lot of marketplaces out there that are looking really at credit cards and financial products. Yeah. But we've really taken another approach of like, you come to progress not looking for a product, you come to progress looking to solve a specific goal, and yeah. we can help you achieve this goal. We're going to do the heavy lifting for you rather than have you do all the research and not necessarily understanding what's right or wrong. We also want to be as neutral as possible. And what I mean by this is giving our customers the ability to choose from a number of, uh, of different companies, giving the pros and cons of every company that we have on site. And this is really important rather than just trying to shove and push products to our customers. We want to be as neutral as possible, as um, as advertising light as possible, and mm. basically have the customer navigate to our site in order to find the right thing for them. And no. so this is, in or to some extent, what makes Progress a bit different than other companies or some of the other companies. Yeah, have. no, definitely. I like the approach you guys take where it's, you have a goal in mind, we're going to help you achieve that goal through side jobs, earning money online, rather than this product will allow you to achieve that. And it gives them the power to pick and choose. And I was looking at all the different companies and there's a variety of them. And I think it's a very novel, unique way of going to it, rather than saying, these are the 10 different credit cards. These are the loans. These are the rates you can go about there. And I think it's a more intuitive way, yeah. I think is, is the word. Um, conscious of time. Um, and I think the last thing what we're good to wrap up is what can we expect to see from ProGrad in the future? What are you guys building on? What are you planning to do to take it to the next, next level? So I'd say we're building a few extremely exciting uh, products internally that would uh, that will be the first few products that ProGrad will launch the internal products to our ProGrad. We've mm-hmm. launched um, something around open banking that's a bit different than uh, the usual open banking that uh, people will see out there. So this was the first one in the series of products that we're looking to launch internally, our own uh, ProGrad products. Yes. That we can monetize and we can help the customer monetize with, etc. rather than just uh, having the customer outbound to different companies so this is uh some of the things that we have in our roadmap at the moment no definitely sounds good i think it was interesting to hear your story your passion for building a company like this and the beauty is you face the problem yourself and i think that's the best founders that face the problem themselves and now you realize that it wasn't just you and your co-founder many other people are facing the same problem Um, and you're doing in a very novel way with the side hustles, with the different products that you do showcase afterwards. Um, but no, Ethan, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Um, we'll definitely link ProGrad and all the stuff you're doing. And then obviously leave details if people want to reach out to you directly and learn from you. Totally. I'd love to have people uh, reach out and thank you very much uh, for making the time, for having me on the no, podcast. It was great sharing my story with you. No, thank you.